Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Living Room Disciple Podcast. We're so glad you're here and our heart for you is quite simple. We want to see you formed into the image of Christ. But here's the thing, we are very aware that everything we encounter is forming us. Sometimes to be more like Jesus and sometimes to be less like Jesus. So we're taking a hard look at our world and our lives and simply asking the question, how is this forming us? So join us in our journey towards Jesus as we dive into the first episode of The Living Room Disciple, where discipleship finds a home. Thank you for joining us today on the first episode of The Living Room Disciple podcast. My name is Phil Snyder, and I want to take just a moment to let you know what you're listening to and hopefully let you know why you're even listening. So a few years back, I had the opportunity to um, read some literature uh, in one book in particular called The Liturgy of Politics by Caitlin Chess. And the subtitle says, I think, even more than the title does, Spiritual Formation for the Sake of My Neighbor. So me and others, including the co-host of this pod that I will introduce in a little bit, read through and dug through the material of this text. And one of the things that resonated with me deeply was to ask myself the question, often regularly about almost everything, how is this thing, this this news I'm reading, this music I'm listening to, this show I'm watching, this game I'm playing, um, the conversations I'm having, how are they forming me? How are they shaping me? How are they making me less or more like Christ? In case it's not clear, uh, I'm an apprentice of Jesus, and I hope you are too. It's a pretty amazing life, but it's also a journey, a very long and wonderful and beautiful journey, and part of that journey is a wrestling, a wrestling with our own sin nature and a wrestling with the Lord and And along the journey and along the consistency of that wrestle, I've learned a few things that have helped me navigate and do a better job moving forward in this life. And during this pod, I want you to listen to a wrestling between myself and my co-host, Nick O'Brien, as we process through how are these things in our lives forming us. So in, in the kind of concept of, of coming to this pod, um, I knew, uh, especially just through really revelation from the Lord and, and just some prayer, that Nick O'Brien had to do this with me. <laughs> and I'm so grateful, Nick, that you said yes. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to ask that you tell me a little bit, why did you say yes when I asked you to join the pod with me? Yeah, well, first of all, it is a tremendous honor. So thank you for for inviting me and thinking of me. But um, it was it was honestly a pretty easy yes because, like Phil said, we we were in that book club together and, and really dove into that question and have been able to dive into that question for a couple of years ever since. And I've just become fascinated with looking at things slightly deeper than the surface level, not just asking what am I doing, but how is it forming me? What am I saying, but how is it forming me? What am I thinking, but how is it forming me? And just to ask that question that's one step, one level deeper um, has been so formational in both my discipleship, but also uh, ministry to others and, and my walk with Christ. Tell me a little bit about Um, you and your walk with Christ. We're going to do some intros because now hopefully you're getting a sense of of what this pod will be like. I'll go over what we can consider pod housekeeping items in a moment (laughs) so you've got to know the pattern of the show going forward beyond this episode. But um, first, I want you to get to know a little bit of who is here. So uh, Nick, share just a little bit like the, right? Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) Give us us Nick O'Brien on a pamphlet. What do we need to know about you? All right. Elevator pitch. Um, so I am I am a husband and father. I've uh, been married to my beautiful wife, Taylor, for, for just over five years. Um, actually, mm-hmm. coming up on, on six years this year. And have two wonderful children. They are. They'll be three in March, and the other one will be one in May. So um, little tiny tots that keep me very busy and very tired. Um, 
for work. I'm a, I'm a worship pastor at a local Methodist church here in Brevard County, Florida, the Space Coast, um, where Kennedy Space Center is, and it's a, it's a blast. I love um, not just leading worship and, and doing ministry with, with our ministry staff, but um, this is one of the areas that has been so, so incredibly interesting to start asking the question, how is worship ministry forming the people in my church? Um, so I'm excited to dive into that in the future. Yeah, uh, I have a huge personal passion for the way music forms us, and so uh, I can't wait. That will be so. <laughs> so just to even give a little hint of the things that are coming, right? Like why keep listening to this podcast, and it's because we're, over time we're going to wrestle with sometimes coming back to the same topic and wrestling in different ways with things like you know how do we as a church um, community. If we worship mm. this way, how does that form us positively and negatively? If we worship that way, uh, if we, you know, if we perceive this current event this way, how does that form us positively or negatively? And then, of course, um, like any good podcast, we're going to bring other believers, other uh, guests yes. onto the show and learn from them, and that's really, really important to us. Uh, I'll introduce myself quickly. A um, lot of similarities and parallels, but cool differences between Nick and myself. First off, I cannot sing, um, but I do give <laughs> it a good effort. Uh, so Phil Snyder, I uh, also live on the Space Coast. It is also uh, just wonderful to, to be here in Central Florida. I've been married to my beautiful wife, Brittany, for just going o- almost 11 years. Uh, and we have four boys, because I only know how to make boys. Um, figured that out and just stuck with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We both. Yeah. And if you are is, looking for a podcast about raising girls, this is not it. Yeah, this is it. We got to find. We got to find no somebody experience. else who knows better. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Clueless. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to know, you know, have a conversation about you know how Nerf guns and toy swords shape and form little boys, Ooh. we are going to talk about that at some point because um, that is that is a conversation topic. Uh, so I. I'm a a former educator in the public school system. I taught English, and now I do uh, more like adult leadership education uh, at a local Christian ministry, Um, and it's it's really exciting. Um, But I think my my ultimate passion. So I do have lots of experience with leadership, and and I have a degree, a master's degree uh, in leadership. So I know we'll talk about these kind of adjacent topics. But I think uh, my big passion really comes from some of the things that don't get paid for. So. Uh, my wife and I uh, host a home church in our in our home every Sunday night. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing, and I'm excited to share stories from that adventure because in that context, we actually uh, in- encourage, I don't want to say require, but we really encourage the people who come to our home church to be involved in you know a more corporate style church as well. And it's been really beautiful and wonderful to watch people be nourished um, in, in a way that maybe is a little bit unique to the home church setting. So actually, let's just, let's dive a little bit into that even. Yeah, absolutely. So the term, the living room disciple, comes a little bit from my time uh, for about a year now pastoring this home church and taking a risk really and, and stepping out and saying yes to the Lord when I felt he was pushing me in that direction. Uh, was a big deal, and it's difficult to come sometimes into starting a church. The very first question anybody asks you if you say you, you're you hosting a church is, do you know Nick? Do you know? No. I'm excited to find out. It It's kind of a commentary on our society. First question every single time. How many people come? Every time. Mm. Without fail, doesn't matter their spiritual background, doesn't matter if they're a Christian or not a Christian, doesn't matter every time. So how many people attend? Interesting. Uh, which is so funny because, and I really mean this, I actually don't count. And so like, I, and I almost make like a conscious effort not to. So, uh, but in the, in the context of that, it, you know, regardless of how many people come, it's been wonderful to have conversations in my living room, right? Right here in my kitchen. Some of the best moments of healing that I've seen people go through have happened at my kitchen table or I, I make people do dishes. I don't actually make, they offer, but it's beautiful and wonderful. <laughs> and sometimes when we have a new person, though, spiritual I do say, formation Come. opportunities. So, no, you know, too far. 
There, well, I, no, actually, I would say it's <laughs> accurate. Look, okay, here's the deal. Pro tip. So you're going to get so many asides in this podcast. Um, bring someone into to your home, and you, you know, as a believer, you probably want them to feel like family. Then they come to you and they say, so "What can I do to help?" Right? Because they see you're finishing up dinner or mm. you're cleaning up, and then you say nothing. You never say that to family. Mm. That isn't what you say to family, mm. right? If we were family, you would say, "Hey, could you grab the dishes? Hey, could you bring that? Hey, could you yell at the kids to come inside?" That's what you say to family, right? So we've had people like literally in our home for like 15 minutes. And they do the, the very polite, normal thing where they say, hey, you know, like, is there anything I could do to help as we get settled, you know? And then I say, yeah, here are the forks. Can you put them at the, at the table? <laughs> and it's so countercultural and it breaks down walls hmm. um, so fast, so fast. And so I've had some of the most amazing conversations about discipleship and, and holiness um, doing dishes with someone. Yeah, like, yeah. They, they're washing, I'm washing, we're drying. Um, and we're talking about Jesus and we're talking about our life and we're talking about the difficulties because when your hands are focused on this task, your mind mm. kind of opens up and you're not really thinking about what's this person thinking of me. You're not really wondering, um, you know, we've all kind of been doing the Zoom Skype call. Where me and you are kind of doing that right now, Nick. Mm -hmm. And there's this tendency to like look at your camera feed and try to like, you know, am I using my hand gestures right? You know, like am I, am I smiling enough, right? Doing that, that thing. But when you're doing dishes, you aren't thinking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just thinking about the words you're saying and whether or not the fork is, is clean. Right. And so it's in that context that we begin having conversations where a lot of times I didn't know the answer. We would just wrestle, we would talk. And I would see that the spirit would, would raise up in me the, the gifting of teaching without preparation. Like there was no sermon prep. There was just, he inspired the right things at the right time, sometimes from my own past experiences, sometimes from wisdom that couldn't have been mine. And I felt deeply like that was something that, that I wanted to share. And so the living room disciple kind of formed from that. And so right now it, it has two mm. forks, um, a column that is uh, being hosted on Patheos. We'll put that link in the show notes that will be live by the time this episode airs. And then what I'm honestly most excited about is um, me and you coming together to wrestle with these topics as well. So I'm going to kick it over to you, Nick. Like when I'm even when as I'm saying those kind of things, or, or you read um, the article that we'll link in the show notes on mm -hmm. living room discipleship. What are some of the things that stick out and stand out in your mind as it relates to that idea? Well, first of all, I want to point out that we are both sitting on our living room couches. We're, we're doing the living room disciple thing here, having this discussion. Um, but yeah, I just want to comment on, on that dishes thing because I think, I think it's so fascinating to think of the church as family, and, and that's kind of a Christian cliche. These are my brothers and sisters in Christ. But Phil, I've just never really thought about it in that way that we can challenge one another like brothers and sisters. We can invite one another into family life like brothers and sisters. It's not just love them like you're, you're my brother, love them like, like my sister, but it's also challenge them like, like my brother, challenge them like my sister, invite them into the normal everyday messy life like a brother or sister. Um, and that's really beautiful. And I appreciate that because it's not just giving them a chance to have deep conversation with you in a way that, that lets their guard down, but I think it also lets the guard down of, you know, what is what is this person thinking of me? They, they want me to think that their house is nice and that they have everything put together and the dishes are done and they're inviting me into the mess. And there's something something profound and, you know, brotherly about that that, yeah. that is so rare in church community where we all want to wear the, the mask that, that makes it look like we have our lives put together. But the act of inviting somebody else into your mess invites them to feel open to share their messes, right? Um, and that's that's really what community is all about, being vulnerable with one another, whether it's with the dishes or whether it's breaking down and, and telling the, the heartbreaking stories that we all have um, and, and not keeping that close to the chest, but but being open with one another and walking through the, the valley of the shadow of death with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so thank you for that example of, of just inviting people to do the dishes with you. But I think... <laughs> I think the, the ability to be vulnerable is something that is should be unique to family. And when we talk about the church mm -hmm. as family, I think I think we can reclaim that. 
And to add to that, vulnerability means risk. And and I think that's, yes. you know, as people are probably listening to this, that's the first thing, right? Like being willing to invite someone into your mess means that you have to do the most countercultural thing, I think, or at least one of the most countercultural things today, which is to, to open up um, the negative parts of your life. So me and my wife invited people. We have a, we have a really small home, or at least by I think most today's standards. We have a sub thousand square foot home that already has six humans occupying it. And then we bring a bunch of people into it. And I think a lot of people would have said, hey, you know, like my house is too small. It's not nice enough to do X, Y, Z. Um, and, and then all the other things, right? I, I'm, I'm, I've potty trained three boys in our guest bathroom. Okay, like, like I'm not saying anything more, but I'm saying that, you know what I'm saying? Like it's not always the nicest home to You're bring people into. You're inviting people into the mess. Into the mess. <laughs> But that is modeled for us. So sometimes we, we look to Christ and we only want to see uh, our version of the washing of the feet of the disciples. And then we say, well, I have, to, mm. I have to do that. But we forget about the baby that was born that nursed. Mm. Right? Like that's that's the first step. Jesus, uh, you know, God comes, right, incarnate as a child, totally vulnerable, totally weak, and by default, I have I have a, a, a five month old. He only gets served <laughs> like that's it. You know what I mean? Jesus mm-hmm. was served exclusively for the first few years of his life as a necessity of, of becoming vulnerable and 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 lowering. You know, d- divine becomes man, right? Like that process inherently meant that there was this sur- like Jesus was served. Um, and Jesus, that, that models even into his adult ministry, right? Because, well, that was when he was a child. Well, ha, you know, he looked at Mary who broke um, the perfume onto his feet, right? And he mm-hmm. didn't say, no, we're going to put it on your feet. He let her do it. Wow. And I think that's vulnerable. That's not yeah. just like he didn't do it with the mentality of I deserve this. He did it with the mentality of the most loving thing I can do for you right now is to receive the thing you are giving to me right now. Hmm. Yeah, and, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's that's family, right? <laughs> so family does that, mm-hmm. and, and that's we expect that a little bit with uh, with blood relations. We should expect it more when we've gone th- so physical birth, blood relation, siblings. We get that. Then we have new birth into a family of God. Mm-hmm. That 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 family is eternal in a way that that blood family isn't, right? And so. We should expect that type of, of um, submission to one another. That's really what that means. Um, even more so. But it, but it, it's 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 definitely countercultural. Um, and diff- it's Absolutely. just different. Yeah. And when we think about loving our neighbor, I mean, I'm I'm not an expert on on this, but there I've heard some some wonderful people talk about you know serving in, in homeless ministry or, or serving other people who who Jesus might call the least of these, right? Um, and how important it is to serve in a way that is mutual, not not just I'm going to come give you some some of my help that I can offer you, but yeah. but really entering into relationship with people, and not thinking of it as I can offer you something and you have nothing to offer me, um, but thinking yeah. of it as what if we enter into relationship and serve one another, um, and maybe it just ha- so happens to be that that you're struggling to get by financially and I can offer you food or, or something for your family. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can offer me life and love and blessing and, mm-hmm. and all of those things that, that come from family that are honestly more valuable than, than mm-hmm. financial, financial gifts. But, um, I think it can be a little patronizing in the way we try to love our neighbor sometimes. Um, and again, I'm not an expert on this and there are much wiser people speaking about this issue than, than me, but I think it can be so valuable, um, to reframe the way we think about serving our neighbor to think of them as neighbor, brother, sister, um, not not somebody in need that that needs me to come and save their day. And and this is what I'm excited about for the podcast. So we have this term spiritual formation, and I think needs just a little mm-hmm. bit of definition. Spiritual formation means that we acknowledge that there are things that are sp- forming us spiritually, and many of them we don't know and notice and realize, and so. We live in a culture that's so reactionary and accusatory, and that's included mm. in the church culture, that it's, you know, 
for example, I think you said something that's very accurate, which is sometimes we go to serve some, some people and love people in a way that's patronizing, right? And it, it it's not an abnormal experience, right, for someone to post something online or, or have a discussion with someone and then be accused of being patronizing in this particular example. And then be like, that's not what my intention was, right? That's not my heart. Like yeah, I wasn't for trying sure. to be. For sure. So the spiritual formation begins to say, okay, what were the things uh, that I'm consuming? What are the past experiences I've had? What are the ways I'm reading the Bible? That would lead me to the the way of thinking that did, without intention, um, you know, make me feel to someone else like I was I was patronizing to them, right? Like I was, hmm. um, even as I tried to to love them, I demeaned them. Maturity says, if that's how I made you feel. I acknowledge that and I want to see what's appropriate in the way that I can change and adjust, right? I can't fully control you, uh, but I can acknowledge that I, I might be able to better attune my actions to serve you, right? That, that's maturity. Mm-hmm. Immaturity says, let's say your fault is a culture thing, right? Uh, you know, you need to change, suck it up, get over it. <laughs> I had good intentions, you know what I mean? And that's what Paul right. meant when he's, or it was part of what he meant when he said, you know, when I was a child, I spoke and thought like a child. And when I was a man, mm. I spoke and thought like a man, right? A child blames everyone else and says, adjust to me. A man right. or an adult, a maturing apprentice of Jesus Christ says, well, I follow a God who had the right to say, adjust to me exclusively, mm. but chose not to. Did not said, consider watch. equality with God as something to be taken advantage of. But ah, themself. yes. Oh my gosh. And yes. And so therefore, if I'm a, uh, I'm stealing a term I've been hearing John Mark Comer use quite often, which is apprentice of Jesus, um, which is a, it's a synonym for disciple of Jesus. But I think the reason I'm, I'm enjoying the word apprentice in this season of my life is um, it has a very tradesman feel to it. Uh, I do, uh, I'm an amateur woodworker. I I like to build furniture. I'm sitting on a couch I built. My computer's (laughs) on a desk I built. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Uh, But I I go to the master woodworker, you too. And I, I, (laughs) 2023, folks. Um, You're on a podcast right now. So there you go. Uh, And I, and I listen to, and I submit to these people who know more about woodworking than I I do. and, And I take on the techniques they tell me to take on. And I, uh, get creative with some of the ideas they present, but generally speaking, I'm beginning with modeling their techniques, and then uh, uh, you know adding the, the fill flare later on. Well, that's what apprenticeship to Jesus is, right? You know, like mm. we choose to submit and model to His techniques first, and then there might be times where our personalities rise through, and there gets to be the beauty of the way that Nick does it versus the way that Phil does it versus the ways that you know, Sally out there does it or, or John or whatever. Um, but it begins with a humble submission to the master. And in mm. this case, you know, we're not, not woodworking like I like to do. It's life. It's, it's apprenticing. You know, we entered into a new life, but now I don't know how to live in this new life. I don't know how to navigate yeah. this new life. I'm very clear. How clueless. do I live as a citizen of the kingdom? Yeah. And so we open up scriptures we, 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 uh, iron sharpens iron. We do this together and together we are apprenticing under Jesus and modeling ourselves after him. So, um, in a lot of ways, that's what spiritual formation really is. I love that. I actually wrote down, I have this kind of list that, that comes from two places that I kind of put together and Frankenstein, my own version of it that was helpful to me. Um, but part of it comes from kind of a catchphrase or a motto that's used at Bridgetown church, which is John Mark Comer's church mm-hmm. that he helped to found and plant. Um, and part of it was adapted from a sentence in the book Seek First by Jeremy Treat, which is a book about seeking first the kingdom of God. Um, and so my kind of meshing together of these two sayings is the goal of being a disciple or an apprentice of Christ is one, to be with Jesus, simply to be with him, mm-hmm. to spend time with him. And two, while you're doing that, to learn from him. While you're doing the dishes with Jesus, you, you learn from from his his discussions and the things you talk about. Um, Three, you become like Jesus. The more time you spend with him, the more you learn from him, you become like him. 
and four, because you've become like him, you do what he did. And he said that we'll do greater things than he did um, when we come together as the body of Christ. Um, and that brings me to, I think, part of the, the article that you shared with me, Phil, that's going to be on Patheos. Part of what was so helpful to me was the idea of of community and formation in community, that we are we are more easily formed to become like Christ when we are together, not, not alone, not just with... Um, early morning quiet time with the Bible and, and our cup of coffee and our Instagram photo. Um, but when we come together, there's there's something special about the way we can be formed. Um, and that the article just really made me think of the imagery in the New Testament of the body of Christ, um, where when Jesus ascends to heaven and then sends us his spirit, he forms us into some type of body where we literally become his hands and feet on earth. Um, he's, he's in heaven right now waiting to return again and make all things new but in the meantime we are the the hands and feet of christ we are the ambassadors of the kingdom um so i think it's it's funny oftentimes when we think that the best way to be formed like jesus is to be in individualistic kind of kind of ways when we are literally part of his body when we're in community we're literally part of jesus's body on earth as in heaven when we are in community um, so why why should we expect to be formed to be like Jesus when we are straying away from the body that we've been grafted into? Yeah, and I, man, this is the this is the tough thing, and and this is where we're really careful. And I think you you'll really get a sense from me and Nick that this is our heart. I'm I'm in this constant relearning in my life, right? And it's beautiful and it's wonderful. Um, I think when Paul writes, my body is wasting away, but but our minds can be renewed daily. Mm-hmm. I think this is a part of it, right? I think that the fact that my back hurts because I was doing stuff with my kids earlier, but but I'm in a state as I've been following Jesus now for, for a decade and a half that I'm at a point where, where my mind is kind of being re- made new every day. I think about what the word repentance means. The word hmm. repentance means to change your mind and then your yeah. actions follow that. So we, we're on this pod, we're, the goal is to ask tough questions like, not with condemnation, and that's key, because me and you, Nick, between the two of us, uh, we've probably committed most, if not every sin, and so, <laughs> can't, you know what I mean? Like, that's just not, we're, we're we'll not saying notes judgment. Later. <laughs> yeah, we're right. You know, um, so that's not it. But the key is, is like to show how how do we learn then? F- this this is the, the question I'm imagining people asking, right? And maybe maybe people are gonna listen to this, and be like Phil, I don't care about that question. But this is the question I'm imagining, which is, well, Phil, then how do I understand the areas that that I'm 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 going astray, and how do I make changes? We all have have encountered in, in areas in our life in which. We, we know something we want to change, but we don't, we don't know how to make some of those changes, right? We, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I've ever talked to a Christian who told me they did not want to be in community, hmm. right? I don't want to be was never the excuse for not being, right? Because that's not it. Right. So we'll talk through our difficulties that we've had with community in the past and what were the things that we've learned in order to, to, to make uh, or to be effective parts of a community. And... A lot of that, and this is the key, I think, that we don't talk about enough in our culture and that we'll hone in here. A lot is that a lot of that is simple, small decisions that affect long term. So I'll use a a quick, very, very quick example, and then then I have a question for Nick. I'm gonna throw to you. Uh, Again, I don't think I've ever talked to a dad who said, I really just wanted to wake up and be negligent to my children, right? Like that that doesn't happen. But a lot of us are like, why am I not the dad I want to be? You know what I mean? Like, why mm. am I why am I impatient with my kids? Why do I not yeah. give them the time they want? Why did they go to bed tonight? And I don't think I even looked at them, uh, really looked at them. Mm. And uh, I've struggled with that for sure. And so uh, and anyways, totally not even thinking about parenting. Uh, January 1st rolls around, and I, I decided to do a, a pretty long fast from some core things in my life that take up a lot of my time. So uh, I decided to give the Lord the first 10th of the year. In fact, today, the day we're recording this, ends the fast. Uh, I was fasting the news and uh, fasting video games. And uh, part of all that was I made some pretty big changes to my phone 
kind of launching into that. So I removed every app from my phone that wasn't productivity oriented. So even YouTube, um, literally, if it how do you woodwork? Have a, I, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Anyways, uh, I, I actually haven't in the past month. No, <laughs> pause, 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 pause. I have. And here's the key. With my sons. Nice. In the, in the past month, I've made uh, a table, spear, sword, shield, medieval armory, evidently, a windmill, and all these things with my kids. What I'm trying to get at is this. By making this small change, not, not with the goal of being a better dad, I had so much more mental space to give to, I have four children, but uh, one's five months old. So I'm kind of thinking about my, my three older children who, you know, consume a lot of time. And, and just in this one month, I had the idea to start, you know, every Monday morning before work, I could just take one kid out and rotate. Mm-hmm. That's, not a, that's not a big deal. Take a kid out, grab a bagel, split a bagel, you know, keep it cheap. The economy these days, you know, and just enjoy a little bit of time with him and next week do the same thing and then started a new bedtime routine that we do two or three times a week called ninja night where they have to clean up the house brush teeth go potty do all the things but they have to do it like ninjas it's the quietest night of the week (laughs) just things like that that i didn't have the mental space to get to because i was exhausted because i was just waiting to get him in bed so i could sit on the couch and all these other things but when i made small core changes that were forming me away from the person I wanted to be. I Naturally, who I am kind of uh, adapted to, 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 the, to the man that I knew the Lord wanted me to be, at least in this, in this mm-hmm. aspect. So uh, some of the things that I, that I did won't work for you. And so as we talk about things, we'll, we'll address, you know, what does it look like here? What does it look like there? Me and Nick will share ideas. We'll, we'll grab smarter people than us to bring them in to also share. But as we're wrapping up, because we do want to wrap up our time, I want to leave everyone with a bit of an understanding about who uh, we are, maybe on just a just one more deeper level. And I, I guess I even want to give you all a little foreshadowing of maybe the things that me and Nick care about the most and the things that we're bringing to this is something that we're the most passionate about. At least today, that could change, that can uh, evolve over time. But uh, For sure. Nick, if there was an you know one thing, one area that at least in your sphere of influence, you could help people grow and, and be formed in, um, what would that be? How, how would you respond to that? Well, I want to start with myself and how I want to be formed in something I'm noticing in myself that is not Christ-like. Um, and that is both my temptation towards hurry and rushing things um, and rushing my kids to bed so I can sit on the couch is, is a great example. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I think that the main thing that, that came to mind when you asked me that question um, is working on developing my attention span. Um, so the, the easy example is when I'm, when I'm reading, whether a, a book or the Bible or anything else, um, how easy it is to have my attention trail off um, because I'm used to reading little quick bites of, mm-hmm. of statuses and tweets and Instagrams and, and things like that. Um, or even, I don't know if this relates to you or hits you, but um, I've even found over the last several years that it's, it's getting harder and harder to watch a movie because you're used to watching, you know, little, whether it's TikToks or Reels or YouTube videos or things that are so short that, that it's hard to hold an attention span. But the reason to that, bring that that's home. Imp- I just yeah. watched the Lord of the Rings series with my wife yeah. the last like month, and we, yeah. we watched them, and I kid you not, in 30-minute increments, because exactly. that's how we watch things now. Yeah, Exactly, yeah, and I, I, I could be wrong, but I don't think it used to be that way, but um, where this is such a big deal is, A, my attention span for prayer is the very spiritual mm-hmm. answer, um, but B, my attention span for talking with my wife, or mm-hmm. sitting with my sons, or... Um, having a conversation with my friend Phil or um, just mm-hmm. just the attention span that we can give to our neighbor, the, the way we can just lock in and pay attention and not have to look at our phone, not have to zone off into something else, not have to trail off into thinking about our worries about tomorrow or whatever it is. But um, I, I really want to get better at, at being in the moment and having an attention span that lasts longer than a TikTok. Yeah. It's so good. It's so good and so relevant. Um, I said TikTok, so relevant. 
<laughs> so, we're in 2023, folks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm <laughs> cutting cool. edge podcast. Cutting edge. Uh, cutting edge. Oh, gosh. Um, that's really good, Nick. I, I am in agreement. You know, I was thinking about this question because, you know, we threw uh, in Slack to one another, kind of thinking about it ahead of time. And there's so many things. I have like this laundry list of, we, hmm. we are not running short on episode ideas, okay? Um, huh. But if I could, if I could even center down to one thing that I want to be able to pass on to people who are listening to this pod, to the, the people whom I love and, and, and doing ministry with in my life, it is to, 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 to give a vision for what spiritual maturity could be. Hmm. And for what a life of following Jesus could be like. Because, so when I was a teacher in the public school system, we learned a methodology called um, begin with the end in mind. And it's just, it's just a framework hmm. for a whole lot of things. You know, many industries use that, that understanding, which, which just means this, you know, if I'm making a lesson plan, if I'm making a training, um, I begin with, with the question, what do I want my learners to be able to do? Who do I want them to become? How do I want them to think? How do I want them to feel? And then when I have that, that picture, I work backwards. I just don't think we do that very well as a church, collectively. You know, I think a lot of us my growth, let me put it this way, my growth, I think, began to skyrocket when I had two older couples in my life that I looked to, me and my wife looked to together, and we said, whoa, let's be like that, <laughs> you know? And and we should be able to say, well, Phil, you just want to be like Jesus, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. but there's a reason Paul had to say, follow me as I follow Christ, because sure. Jesus didn't actually set up his church to just follow an abstract understanding of him from the limited set of letters that we have. Those are core to our understanding. But he designed his purpose. Part of, and this is my personal opinion, I have no <laughs> theological basis for this. I mean, I have a loose theological basis for this. That I think that sometimes the Lord holds back some of his power, wisdom, and discernment until we're in community. Hmm. You know, which kind of makes sense, right? There's this idea of like, if you're the peaky, pink, pinky, oh, how do you say that word? <laughs> you're the pinky. Pick another finger. Of the hand. I don't know, right? Thumb. There you go. <laughs> Whatever. If you're a finger, why think that you would do anything with excellence if I just cut you off and chucked you somewhere? Yeah, no doubt. You're just going to rot and die, right? That's the hmm. analogy that we're given. So, But what if the pinky had, has a holy book? <laughs> uh, you, you know, it, that's a funny thing, too. We need to talk about scripture at some point. Because uh, yeah. somehow, somehow Christians survived about 500 years without a canonized text. Hmm. Uh, and during that time, uh, they would eventually, the, the, the gospel would spread through the known world. And the Roman government that was murdering and, and martyring uh, believers would actually uh, come to adopt Christianity as its as its national religion, despite the fact that there was no canonized scripture. And so that is not in any way, shape, or form uh, uh, negating the importance of, of canonized scripture. We actually should probably revere it more, knowing that hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands probably, of people have, have died, um, in part, not to give a scripture, that would be inaccurate, like, uh, you know, but um, because they believed that that to love their brother and sister in Christ was was to in part you know provide provide these documents, um, which many of them had no idea would become holy scripture. They were just letters from their their friends and apostles. Um, so we're really excited you're here. Me uh, and Nick are new to this. This is an exciting journey that we're beginning. So please just continue to walk with us through this process. And uh, I'm excited to see where this goes. Nick, thanks Absolutely. for saying yes. Thanks for being here with me. Thank you for having me. 
God bless everyone. You have been listening to the Living Room Disciple Podcast, and we are glad that you are here. Throughout the month of March, we are excited to introduce you and others to this brand new endeavor. However, we will be taking the month of April off, so please make sure to subscribe to this podcast so that way you'll hear us in your feeds in May. In fact, we're taking the month off to figure out how to do this even better. There's a survey that we'd love for you to take in the show notes to give us feedback. And also, don't forget to rate the pod. Throughout the month of March, Nick and myself are excited to bring to you five different conversations. Three of them will be between Nick and myself talking about spiritual formation around things like hell and damnation and the idea of living room discipleship. The other two weeks, we'll each be interviewing people who are deeply formative for us, and we're excited to introduce you to them. Huge shout out to our production staff, Anissa Live, and to our marketing manager, Eric Church. Thank you so much for all the work you do. This is a production of the Living Room Disciple Media, and we're glad you're here.